Hey, it's Justin Harvey. Thanks for tuning in to the Anesthesia and Pain Management Success Podcast. With APM Success, we take a close look at important topics pertaining to business, practice management, personal finance, and careers for anesthesiologists and pain management physicians. We work hard to take your critical questions straight to the experts. Thanks for listening. Hello and welcome to episode 227 of Anesthesia and Pain Management Success. Very pleased to be joined by friend of the show, Dr. Brian Schmutzler, coming in live from uh, the heartland, Indiana. <laughs> right. It's cold here. Very cold. <laughs> There's a, We're getting a blizzard here in the mountains in Oregon. That, that doesn't happen very often, although last year here in Portland, we were lucky to get like eight or nine inches, just surprise inches, which... I got to admit, it did bring out my inner nine-year-old. Like, yeah. like you wake up and you open the curtains and you see uh, Winter Wonderland. That still just really makes me happy. Spoken like schools like a, closed and all yeah. that kind of fun stuff. Like did you go snow, ski? Did you go ski at least? I uh, have learned that snow sports are not for me. <laughs> all right. All my, right. Uh, my back cannot handle it anymore. One too many getting slammed on my tailbone during uh, middle and high school wrestling. Fair enough. But uh, yes. So, Brian, thanks for joining. As always, you're one of these people that I appreciate the industry perspective that you bring to bear because of your clinical background, but also the way you participate in the business of medicine and of anesthesia in particular. We had a great conversation here just the last few minutes before we hit the record button, which gets me all fired up about healthcare and, you know, the the, <laughs> the chessboard, mm -hmm. um, all the, the key stakeholders and players and one of the things that I know, I saw this, this is hot off the press as of our day of recording here on January 8th. This will go live in a couple of weeks, but the uh, Department of Health and Human Services just named their first chief competition officer. So, uh, yeah, we're, for anybody who's not subscribed to the YouTube channel, um, that was just put in air quotes by our guest. I'm not going to make any further political comments about it, but good reminder, give us a sub on YouTube. We're up to 700 and some. Always appreciate people following there so you can get latest and greatest updates. The um, the way that this role has been described, according to, uh, I'm looking at Becker's right now, and we'll throw this in the show notes. Um, this role is supposed to, quote, play a leading role in working with the FTC and the Department of Justice to address concentration in healthcare markets through data sharing, reciprocal training programs, and the further development of additional healthcare competition policy initiatives. So we will see how that unfolds obviously competition and consolidation and the lack of competition and physicians all abandoning independent or being driven from independent practice in order to continue to practice clinical medicine is a huge problem so yeah. what do you make of this brian uh interesting we'll see how that plays out um i, I don't have a whole lot of faith that that a lot's going to happen, but I could be wrong. Um, I mean, I, I think certainly the the thought of of pursuing this alongside the FTC is is going to be interesting. Um, I think that's part of what we're going to talk about today is kind of the future of of anesthesia looking into twenty twenty four. Had a few things we wanted to talk about. One being FTC and some of their um, actions around the country, um, in particular in in Texas, uh, with some of the bigger anesthesia groups. So I mean, maybe. Maybe this will help not only on the um, large practice, private equity backed end of things, but perhaps on the consolidation on some other sides of things, um, insurance companies, that sort of thing. So, yeah, I, I'm curious in your perspective on this. I, I It seems like there's a lot of people talking about policy right now to an extent. I feel like the the volume is just much, much higher. I think in the last even 12 months, and maybe it's because of the people I follow on LinkedIn and I got off of Twitter because I couldn't handle that anymore or the formerly known as Twitter. Um, yeah. But a, another interesting uh, sort of voice is uh, Dr. Bai, B-A-I, uh, okay. who is a, she's a CPA, PhD, healthcare policy analyst out of Hopkins. And she's always up on the hill chattering about her latest bit of research. And her um, perspective I have found to be very interesting is sort of pulling the cover off of uh, the the way that the healthcare machine works and trying to like, bring it to bring more popular awareness to some of the deeply entrenched perverse incentives. And so for anybody listening, who's this is going to be a policy forward discussion talking about what 
Dr. Schmutzler think is thinks is coming down the pike in 2024 and the ways that these policy trends are shaping healthcare. But check out Dr. Bai's work. As you're, uh, if you're listening and interested, we'll drop a couple notes in the uh, the show notes as well. What's her so, latest? What's her latest? Oh man, it's every day is a new thing. The the one uh, one that is kind of on the top of my brain was um, just looking at access to care as it relates to payer mix and hospital location and urban versus rural and oh, the yeah. economics of a rural hospital and what it means for the kind of doctors you can pay to be there. And what does it mean if this hospital shuts down? And what does it mean that Medicare is paying a tiny fraction of what it actually costs to keep a hospital open? And yeah. what are the implications of that for America? If all of a sudden, if something happens, you've got to go 200 miles to yeah. have something, you know, addressed from a health standpoint. and we, we see that a lot because i spend a lot of time in rural health care between the different things that i do and and yeah definitely i mean we've had probably six or eight hospitals just in maybe the hundred mile radius of where i am uh, either shut down or eliminate portions of services particularly ob ob is the biggest service that seems to be eliminated which has led to some of the critical access hospitals that we work with having ballooning ob services yeah. which they're not prepared for so yeah. sicker patients um, older patients, which an OB is, is sometimes sicker. Um, and then, uh, just more, you know, it's overloading the, the, uh, the services at the, at the location. So I, I think that she's, she's very insightful in that, in that conversation. Yeah. She's one of those people. I feel like not a lot of people are doing that work, or at least that I'm aware of with the, the approach that she seems to take, which is relatively even handed in my observation. I don't agree with everything she says, but she's obviously eminently qualified yeah. And uh, and is pushing the ball down the field, which is encouraging to me. Yeah, encouraging at least for sure. Yeah. So I, there's a few trends and a few stakeholders that we want to talk about today, Brian. Where do you want to start? Uh, let, let's go with the FTC issues in Texas, and then I think that can roll in pretty nicely to some of the other things we want to talk about. So um, I know Justin, you looked up kind of all the the background on the on the FTC issues with some of the bigger anesthesia groups and the anti-competition and that sort of stuff. Um, and then I, I was going to add to that, it's not an FTC, but it's a state um, looking at a large regional group near me that also kind of had some issues with their anti-competition um, and and kind of pushed them towards not enforcing non-competes, which uh, I thought was an interesting process too. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you kind of share your perspective on the FTC and then I'll share mine um, in, in terms of how it impacts anesthesia as a business going forward. So specifically as it relates to the No Surprises Act, is that what you're talking about? Uh, I was talking more about the the issues in Texas with large anesthesia groups getting sort of uh, looked into and and told they were <laughs> doing anti-competitive practices. That's that's yes. kind of where I started before we rolled into the No Surprises. Yeah. Um, I, so there's, you can just Google this and yeah. anybody can look and see what's going on. Uh, there are anesthesia groups that there are allegations about their um, creating a monopoly and negotiating with payers as a monopoly, meaning the anesthesia group that is providing anesthesia at a number of sites of service in a certain geographic locale, having leverage to, as the allegations go, um, extract higher than market value remuneration for their services. And this is ongoing, unfolding as we speak. And uh, it's interesting. This is one of these areas, as you wade into it, you you understand how murky it all gets. And, you know, I read a lot of these headlines, and I know you do too, Brian, about like private equity is the problem in healthcare, which I, the way I think about this is blaming private equity for doing what it's doing is like blaming a dog for barking or a duck for quacking. Like private equity is going to do what it's going to do. And they chase profit wherever they can in either a legal or a gray area. And if you want them to stop doing that, you got to make it illegal. Right. And we could do that. We could, legislators could do this tomorrow, but the fact is, uh, it's they've chosen not to, they've chosen not to at this point. And so interestingly, this allegation levied against this, um, private equity backed group, if you could call it that, uh, you, and you can call it that. Um, but it's not as simple as that. It's a little reductionistic, but the point is this is an area in which the private equity ownership 
of a physician group is actually um, helpful to the physician cause, I guess you could say, in terms of uh, combating one of the other national trends, which is um, the ongoing beatdown of uh, reimbursement for physician services that continues to drive physicians out of independent practice and into an employed model, often owned by uh, the the payers. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> uh, it's, which is just it's, it's mind bending. Yeah. Very uh, very interwoven. Very yes. complicated. Yes. Um, and, so. From my perspective, what this is like, and my kids love the movie uh, Kong versus um, Godzilla, you know? So for me, sitting back here, not being involved in either one, it's kind of like watching Kong versus Godzilla, right? Like, I mean, these two big juggernauts who, you know, think that they can sort of, you know, wreck the city fighting each other. And so for me, it's it's sort of a, I mean, obviously what happens is going to be important either way. Yeah. Um, but for me, it, I'm, I'm sort of enjoying the show right now, just watching them kind of go after each other and, and battle. Yeah. So. That's an interesting, interesting analogy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I, I think it's going to be interesting to see, you know, I think if the FTC does come down on some of these groups, I think it's going to be interesting to see what that does. Is that going to drive private equity out of anesthesia? I'd guess probably not, but I think they'll be more hesitant. I think the other thing that may happen is that some of these conglomerates may sort of break back up. Um, so, you know, some of these bigger companies went in and bought several private practice or smaller groups. Some of that I think may get shed um, in, in the process. So I think that, overall would be good for competition, sort of getting things back to at least a somewhat more local level and not all out of some national private equity company. Um, and then on the flip side of that, if the FTC decides they're able to negotiate this way, then I think that helps the rest of us um, to with negotiations as well. So um, I think either way that it plays out, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the future. Agreed. And it, no matter what happens, I think the there's going to be the legal determination and then there's going to be perhaps the FTC response. And I think there needs to be sort of pushing the thumb on the other side of the scale, no matter what happens, because if there is a judgment against the anesthesia group and private equity vacates anesthesia, that is because the barking dog uh, no longer sees money in anesthesia, which really what we're saying is there's no reimbursement here because now the anesthesia group has, there has been a a verdict to say you can't charge that anymore right. and so now we have a difficulty running a business doing anesthesia and now we're it's gonna continue to hasten the consolidation right uh and, and so if that does happen in the interest of keeping physicians in charge of their own lives and clinical practice i would hope that either ftc or a legislative initiative would then push down on the other side of the scale and say hey this doesn't mean that insurance companies can do whatever they darn well please you could argue. Yeah. I mean, we're we're seeing that that is happening in a lot of places already. Yeah, but fair fair and customary reimbursement. You know, it's something that you know, and and with an eight and a half percent um, per year uh, inflation rate, you know, I don't think fair and customary means you haven't given us a raise in three, four, five, ten years. So sure. Well, it's going down three percent a year like clockwork. Yeah. So yep. Yep. So that's actually a good segue. Because this ties into the NSA, the, the No Surprises Act conversation. Because understanding what are the market rates for the services that are being provided is a one of the factors that goes into defining what uh, reimbursement can be requested for yeah. a certain set of clinical services. So, Brian, why don't you give us like a brief high-flying overview of what the No Surprises Act is and kind of where it's at right now and how you interact with the No Surprises Act. Yeah. So, I mean, the No Surprises Act, I think it went into effect January 1st of 2022, um, essentially came out uh, as as a, you know, pushback to some of these anesthesia groups who were charging large out of network and not just anesthesia, several different services, but large out of network uh, fees to patients. Um, now, I would say in general, the people who were doing that were doing that as a negotiation tactic and not as something to really, you know, put patients in the poor house. Um, because it gave you the ability to say to an insurance company, if you don't 
give me a reasonable rate. I'm going to go out of network and then your patients are going to be unhappy because they're going to get large bills. Um, but, you know, that became quite a, a hot button issue. And, and the government said, well, you guys can't do that anymore because patients don't choose, you know, an anesthesiologist, a, you know, a radiologist, an ER doc, that sort of stuff. So you can you can argue whether that was good or bad. And we won't we won't get into that. But it is where we are at this point. So um, since that point, it's not that you can't bill out a network, but it's very, very difficult. There's a lot of parameters that need to be met. So I would say in general, anesthesia groups are not billing out a network, um, at least not routinely. And so um, overall, uh, what it's meant is that the insurance companies are are providing us with a certain rate. Um, and we pretty much have to take that rate. We can't really, you know, argue against that rate very much. Um, and in general, it's driven down the, the total amount of per unit reimbursement that the insurance companies are paying. And so the only way, so for instance, if an insurance company says we're only paying you, you know, 150 times Medicare, um, which, you know, if you know what the Medicare rate is, then that's that's not very much for a, for an anesthesia ASA unit. Um, then you can say, well, I'm not going to accept that and I'll go out of network. But the problem is then you have to, every time you submit a claim, you have to go through the independent dispute resolution, the IDR. And so going through the IDR not only is, you know, labor intensive, but also has a cost related to it. And that started out at $350 per uh, assessment. It, it may be more, it may be less now. I think we're, there's some debate as to where that's going, but, um, you know, so, so as a practice owner, you know, I, I can't imagine why you would try to fight that when a lot of your cases don't even pay $350. Um, and so a lot of times what we do is we just, we take what the insurance company gives us. Um, there are instances where you happen to be out of network, not by choice, but because, you know, you've got three patients in a year who come from a certain PPO or HMO. And what typically happens in that process is they just send a letter that says, hey, you're out of network and here's what we're willing to pay you. You sign off and say, we're willing to take that. Or you say, we're not willing to take that. What else can you give us? And if you can't come to, to a, an agreement, then you go to the IDR. Um, I, I personally have never dealt with the IDR, so I don't know. Um, how tenuous that is and and how, you know, difficult, but, um, you know, that's sort of the process at this point. Um, so, yeah, so let's, let's talk a little bit about that and then we'll talk about what's going on in Texas. Yeah. So in terms of the idea, and by the way, let me do a quick shout out to an episode, which I just realized was precisely 100 episodes ago. So episode 127. So if you go to today's show notes, apmsuccess.com slash 227, we're going to drop a bunch of links to, we're going to reference a lot of resources. So check that out. Um, but I talked with Dr. Mo Azam from um, Florida at um, uh, USAP. Uh -huh. Sorry, pre-coffee brain here. And uh, he did a great breakdown. He is involved in their sort of policy and advocacy at USAP. And uh, you can get a great, like, very granular review of the IDR and NSA and everything as it stood as of 2022, which not a lot has substantively changed. But one of the key components that has been um, under judicial scrutiny, one of several, uh, relates to how, you know, if you go through the IDR, there's a formula that's still a little bit of a black box. I don't fully understand. I think this is up to the independent uh, arbitrator to decide who's going to get how much money. But the formula has been deemed as was alleged by the Texas Medical Association, has TSA. been... The has Texas put, Society of Anesthesiologists, I think. TSA. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, they have put too much weight on the what's called the QPA, which I can't remember what that stands for. Do you happen to know off the top uh, of your head? Uh, qualified... Provider uh, amount or something? Right. Yeah, something like that. It yeah. basically is the uh, the amount from the insurance company that, that the average of their in-network rate... So that is one of the factors that is used. And so one of the challenges with this is it creates this incentive for an insurance company to drop everybody's rates, drop yeah. everybody, but certainly anybody at the right end of the distribution who uh, would raise that median rate. And so this lawsuit, which is getting appealed and appealed and appealed, and I the last update that I saw was as of August of 2023. I think this is probably still bouncing around in the courts is, um, is that they're, they, they won like the, the Texas yes, Society of Anesthesiologists won in their case. 
and yep. they were um it was agreed by the courts that the QPA had too big of an impact and that the insurance companies weren't justified in b alleging that it should have as much impact as it does because it's totally fungible based on yeah. exactly yeah the actions of the you can change that anytime i think you had another guest on at one point and I don't think we ever addressed this directly, but I think I texted you a bunch of expletives after that. And I can't remember who it was, but it was somebody who was arguing that the that the NSA was going to be great for anesthesiologists, for hospitals, for everybody. Um, I, I wonder what that guest would think now if he still thinks it'd be great for anesthesiologists and CRNAs and hospitals and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I wonder. Yeah. Um, anyway, so so that all kind of leads into you know we're we're sort of driving down reimbursement even further, right? So so CMS dropped reimbursement 3% as it keeps doing over and over again. Um, the insurance companies are dropping reimbursement and the cost of compensation to providers is going up 30, 40, 50, 60%, right? So how do we how do we as a society, how do we as a as a profession and how do the hospitals afford anesthesia going forward when the insurance companies aren't paying for it. Certainly the patients aren't going to want to pay for it. So really that comes down to the hospitals and the surgery centers chipping in larger and larger portions. I mean, my personal opinion is at some point it's going to hit a tipping point and the hospital is just going to say, it's not even worth it to do surgery anymore. You know, we'll, we'll cone down to three rooms instead of 12. We'll just work day and night, get it figured out. And, and instead of, you know, trying to pay 12 anesthesia providers to be there every day on thin margins. So. It's uh, it feels like the Hydra. It does. <laughs> you can you can eliminate one problem and then two more pop up, and uh, yeah, it also makes me realize how little I know. Even as I'm, you know, I've dipped my toe into this pool as somebody who, for the last handful of years, has had this uh, specialty specific focus in financial advising and investments, and then I see how these policies impact my clients, and then I want to understand the policies, and then it's. Man, that rabbit hole goes down as deep as you want it to. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Let's talk about, Brian, what other trends you see shaping the specialty in 2024. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, the ASA just put out a report about compensation, uh, you know, and number of anesthesia providers and that sort of stuff. Um, so, you know, obviously, right after COVID, the number of anesthesia providers needed and the compensation skyrocketed. Kind of looks like at this point, things are leveling off a little bit. Um, there's still, obviously, increases in comp, significant increases in comp. Um, but it's not as not as precipitous as it was. So I think that's helpful. Um the in the anesthesiologist world, we're fully filling all of the residency slots and still not keeping up with retirements. So that's that's another thing that 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 particular uh, article showed. Um, the even the CRNA and AA, uh, which are you know uh, producing far more providers than than anesthesiologists, um, are are kind of not keeping up with trends either. Um, and so I think from that, the the fastest growing group was the the anesthesia assistants. And even they were, you know, I think a total of maybe 4,000 in the whole country. So obviously that's not a mm -hmm. significant factor. Um, I think that uh, there are now uh, more CRNAs practicing than anesthesiologists, which is kind of the first time in ever. Um, but obviously, you know, they're producing more CRNAs because the, the process is shorter. Um, you know, not significantly, but somewhat shorter, and they're not capped by CMS uh, as to how many how many CRNAs can be uh, can be developed and and trained. Um, I I think we're again at a tipping point. S something's got to give somewhere. I'm not sure what that's going to be. Um, you know, it it may be changing the way that anesthesia is delivered, the locations anesthesia is delivered. You know, um, which which types of cases, and I don't want to say rationing of care, but essentially it becomes rationing of care of, hey, you know, we don't have enough anesthesia to do X and Y elective cases. So you can wait six weeks, eight weeks, six months to have your procedure done until we're not as busy and, you, and we have we have room in our schedule. Um, but something's going to give on one end or the other. Yeah, I mean, I'm already, I don't know what your experience has been. If you've tried to go to the doctor lately, but oh, yeah. Me just going for like some basic, you know, like 
ENT kind of stuff. Like it's not just the, the first step that's a little bit more than dropping into your PCP. And it's like, I'm looking at months. Yep. Uh, and you know, the surgical equivalent of that would be, um, really unsettling. And, you know, I, I have, uh, parents of a certain age who are getting to that part of their lives and they're starting to need, um, healthcare access. And, um, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of, it's tough to think about like what they're going to have to deal with and knowing how confusing everything is. And there's a lot of, I mean, obviously like all the boomers who are aging and hitting that part of the demographic curve that are going to be dealing with less and less access. And have you heard Brian, anything about CMS or Congress addressing the bottleneck in terms of supply and like, are we going to open up more residency seats or new programs and new institutions or anything like that? Yeah, as far as I know, they haven't budgeted aside from their standard. You know, I think the anesthesia residencies go, residency slots go up by like six or seven a year kind of continually. I mean, it needs to be more like 60 or 70 a six, year. Six people or six yeah. programs? No, six or seven spots per year. Six anesthesiologists. Like, yeah, I, I look back at that article and we and we okay. can go by, uh, you know, by that. But it looks like it's yeah. it's their steps you know, roughly less than 10, certainly per year. Wow. And I, and I don't know the exact date on that. So I may be off a bit, but okay. it's not, it's not six or seven programs. It's in the, you know, low, uh, high single or low double digits of, of number of anesthesiologists being produced, uh, and, and budgeted for by CMS. And again, it's a, it's a numbers game, right? I mean, the government doesn't want to spend any more money than they have to. Yeah. And they see that as a cost, not necessarily as a, uh, as a benefit. So, Yeah. I wonder, yeah, I'm just thinking of, yeah, there's a, there's a lot there, but obviously like deferred care because of lack of access creates its own cost of and course. it's a, it's a short termist problem to not create the infrastructure that's necessary. I know I'm pretty it's, a, it's, it's a, this year's budget versus, you know, what things are going to look like 10 years from now. It's, yeah. it's short-sighted, but it, it, it is what it is. It's yeah. what, what our government does. Right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So 2024, what else are you observing as far as industry trends that are going to impact the listeners of this podcast? Uh, I think the locums market is still growing. Um, I think it's really hard to find full-time staff uh, because you can go down the street or, you know, three blocks away and make time and a half or, or double what you're making as a full-time provider. Um, at, at some point, again, that's that's going to hit a tipping point and places are just going to say, now nah, we're just going to shut down ORs. We're not going to do this anymore. Uh, but it hadn't happened yet. And it really hasn't even plateaued. I mean, if you look around, there's a huge portion of, of the anesthesia provider market that's doing pure PRN or locums work, yeah. um, which, which is difficult as a practice owner and is difficult as, um, you know, as a hospital or as an employer. Um you know, not we have a we have a staffing company, so for us it's it's good times. But you know, even then, you know, there's the squeeze from well, this is too expensive, and that's too expensive, and why would we do this, and why would we do that? So you know, um, <clears throat> but I think that's going to be a huge, huge issue. I mean, recruiting for a full time providers is the quintessential issue right now in anesthesia, um, and I there's I mean, I don't think there's a great way to solve it. It's just really hard. People bounce around because they can make more money. Yeah. And as long as they're allowed to do that, there's no, and I tell people, you know, my clients, like I, there's the, all the problems out there. And then there's the, I'm talking to you, me and Dr. Smith to try to like help you to the best thing for your life and your family today. And in that conversation, why would you not work a job where you can do two weeks on two weeks off and make more than you can make in a full-time role? Like that's, yeah. You'd be stupid to say no to that. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, sure, right. I hope that um, we get more anesthesiologists and that, that you know, per, at the macro level, I hope that goes away. At the micro level, you've got to optimize for it. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're in a position to do it, I mean, I would encourage, I would encourage people to look at their options, right? It, the locums is not right for everybody and full time is not right for everybody. Um, if you're only chasing the money, I know you're a financial advisor. If you're only chasing the money and you're doing it at the uh, detriment of some other aspects of your life, then I highly suggest not doing that. I don't do locums because the way I have things set up, I mean, I'm able to be home much more often. And, you know, yeah, could I go out and make more money? Sure, certainly could. But that's not 
that's not for me. So, um, I mean, just looking in, as you say, right. I mean, just looking at your family situation and doing what's best for you. Um, but I mean, it's a system wide issue where if we continue to pay locum so much money, it, it there's going to be very few people who are going to decide that full time is the way to go. So, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's the other part of the conversation and something that I always talk about with my clients is like, you're going to, in most cases, you can make enough to fund your lifestyle. If you're looking at getting a raise in a job transition and it doesn't, you don't need to maximize, like you shouldn't try to make as much money as you possibly can. You should make as much as you need to have a life that looks the way that you want it to. And often that is less than, I mean, most of the time it's less than maximizing except for extreme circumstances. So it does require some amount of self-knowledge and a lot of the doctors that I talk to, they are just like, they've had it, they're burned out, they're tired of having zero autonomy. And so they go from making a, you know, a, a good salary, but not having, not being in control of their own lives to, well, you mean I can be in control that for, in my observation, it's physicians not moving towards money as much, although we see that, but moving towards control. Yeah, <laughs> that that's, is that's the part of it. Thing of it. Calling your own shots, making your own schedule for sure. What What's interesting to me is we're seeing a lot of older physicians and and uh, other anesthesia providers like 60, 65 doing locums because, it you know, they can say, hey, I want to work three days a week, yeah. two weeks a month. And I could make what I used to make as a full time, you know, private practice anesthesiologist in my current or in my previous practice. And now I can go and work three days a week, two weeks a month and make the same amount, kind of cruise out my retirement, deal with this inflation and yeah. market downturn and all that kind of stuff. And then once that's all kind of remedied, cash out and be done. So I would say that's one of the biggest, it's people right out of school and people at the very end of their careers. There's a lot of mid-career guys who are or providers who are kind of taking full-time jobs, but right out of school and which I wouldn't advise mostly because you need a standard place to build your practice, but that's a whole nother issue. And then the, then the end of career guys are just a lot of them, a lot of them doing locums. Yeah. Anything else, Brian, that you want to mention in light of the, uh, the topic at hand of 2024 trends? Yeah, I don't think so. I think we've explored as much as we can explore. You know, I'll probably, probably be wrong on at least half of what I said. And we will do this again in June or July and go back and say, boy, that was dumb. Yeah. Look at that. The NSA has gone or, you know, well, that was dumb whichever the private equity won, you know, so, but yeah. I'd, I'd like to kind of follow up in six months and see how, see how close we were. That sounds like a great idea. Um, so again, for listeners, this is episode 227, go to apmsuccess.com slash 227 to get, uh, links to the various resources we discussed here today. You can also have Dr. Schmutzler's contact info. If you want to reach out to him and say hello, I'm sure he'd appreciate that. Uh, Brian, thanks as always for joining us. My pleasure. If you liked what you heard this week, head on over to apmsuccess.com, where you can find more content and free resources to help you build a successful career in anesthesia and pain management. If you wanted to leave a review in iTunes, I'd also really appreciate it. Thanks for using some of your valuable time to join me today on APM Success.